with that, let me introduce Dr. Allison Snow, who is a professor emerita of the Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology. She studies emerging issues of biotechnology, such as gene-edited wildlife and ecological impacts of genetically engineered crops on natural and agricultural systems. She was trained as a plant ecologist at Hampshire College and the University of Massachusetts. She received postdoctoral fellowships from the National Science Foundation and the Smithsonian Institute before joining the OSU faculty in 1988. Her research combines molecular and ecological approaches to investigate hybridization between crops and their wild relatives, the extent to which genetically engineered traits could benefit weedy plants, and the rapid evolution of herbicide resistance in weeds. She has more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and is the lead author of a very important 2005 position paper by the Ecological Society of America on the environmental impacts of genetically engineered organisms. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program. She has served on the editorial boards of a half dozen journals, president of the Botanical Society of America, and treasurer of the International Society for Biosafety Research. Dr. Snow received a Distinguished Scholar Award from OSU in 2002. She is currently a Distinguished Fellow of the Botanical Society of America and a Distinguished Professor of the OSU College of Arts and Sciences. She founded and led the OSU Office of Undergraduate Research and Creative Inquiry from 2006 to 2015. The title of her seminar today is, as you can read, An Ecologist View of Genetically Engineered Organisms, Past, Present, and Future. So come on up, Allison. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. That was like half my talk in the beginning, so that was good. Uh, <laughs> I know we have to keep track of the time. Uh, well, it's a very special occasion for me to be able to talk to you um, about sort of my life's work while I was at OSU. So it'll be a little bit biographical and a lot about sort of the highlights of genetically engineered organisms and how, they, how they've how they interested me as an ecologist. Um, so I want to start with biography where I grew up in Madison, Connecticut in this little house right here, right next to a salt marsh. And I was fascinated by nature as a kid. and. Uh, that carried, this salt marsh interest carried on for a while. And at the very end of my talk, I did my, my um, undergrad research on Cape Cod. Uh, and at the very end of my talk, I'm going to come back to Nantucket and Cape Cod area where the first genetically engineered mice might be released. So we'll see uh, how that leads to, how we get to that step from starting here. Um, so I, as I said, I, I was really interested in salt marshes. I worked in Alaska as a PhD student. And then I got sort of a, um, enlightened about evolutionary ecology from working in Costa Rica. I did a postdoc there. And I also did a lot of, I took a class in tropical ecology um, and got very interested in evolutionary ecology. And this is kind of leading into looking at evolution in natural systems and then what happens when you engineer those systems. So at the time, back in the 1980s, these are the kinds of books we were reading, Princeton monographs, one called Mate Choice in Plants, which has to do with cross-pollination and hybridization, and another one, Natural Selection in the Wild. And these types of books and schools of thought were very influential, I think, in getting ecologists and evolutionary biologists to sort of combine the fields of ecology and evolution. And also for me, I was interested in more applied questions. So I came to Ohio State in 1988, and there's a faculty picture, thanks to my colleague Todd Stucy, who's here. Here's our part of our department in 1992, and my husband Peter, who's also here. Um, you'll notice I'm the only female in the department. It stayed that way for a while. There was like this one slot. I was replacing other women who had left. <laughs> Kay Gross and Barbara Shaw and then me. But I stayed. Um, and then here's a picture from my retirement party here at the faculty club with a whole bunch of colleagues and grad students. So during this 30 year period, I did spend a lot of time thinking about genetically engineered organisms. And the first ones were plants, genetically engineered crops. 
What this is is showing you the timeline of when genetically engineered crops were introduced, starting in 1996 up to close to the present. And um, you can see that this is the percent of planted acres. They're very, very popular in places like the Midwest. So we have HT soybean, that stands for herbicide tolerant, meaning that they are resistant to Roundup and other types of herbicides. Um, HT cotton and HT corn. So herbicide resistance is a trait that can be put into crops with genetic engineering and then when you spray them, they don't die but the weeds around them do. The other common trait is Bt, which is the name of a bacterium, but a Bt crop is one that is resistant to insect damage. So you don't need to spray as much um, insecticide on those. You spray more uh, herbicide on the ones that are herbicide tolerant, but less insecticide on the ones that are insect tolerant. Um, but you can see the rate of adoption here, and I'm going to divide my talk into two parts. Um, Pre-CRISPR, which I'll explain in a minute, which is about 1996 to 2010, and CRISPR, which is what we're in now. Those are, these are two different types of genetic engineering that are quite different from each other. By the way, if any of you have sun in your eyes and you want to move around, I know the curtains don't close, so feel free to move around in musical chairs. We tried to get those to close. Okay, so the, very, so the difference between these two. Um, the very first transgenes shown here, this type of transgene, um, were uh, basically a gene that could come from any organism, um, usually a bacterium, a promoter that turns that gene on, and a marker gene so that you can select for that gene when you're growing the plants, and a termination sequence. This was very, very common for many, many years. Very simple kind of... Uh, comparatively primitive transgene. So I wrote this back in 2005. You could say that at any time and you would be, you would be right, you know, that today's genetically engineered organisms are going to be overcome by others that are more sophisticated. So I'll get to CRISPR a little bit in the second part of my talk. Uh, it's a real mouthful. We're just going to say CRISPR, but I'll try to say it. Clustered, regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeats. That's what that stands for. But you will see that in the New York Times, you'll see that everywhere, the, the short version of it, CRISPR. And this is much more sophisticated. The gene can go into a certain chromosome, a certain part of that chromosome. It's sometimes called gene editing because you can just knock out a piece of the gene or put a new one in. Okay, so uh, as an ecologist, I'm very interested in the fact that almost any organism can be genetically engineered. And for a long time, you could be able to order these zebrafish online and experience the glow. They're brightly colored zebrafish that are genetically engineered, um, just as one example. But really, all kinds of organisms can be and have been engineered, usually for research purposes, not to release them into the environment. Um, and here you can see the dramatic impact of a single gene for virus resistance in papai papaya. This was developed in Hawaii. So these are the papaya plants that don't have the transgene for, it. it's called virus resistance, and these are the ones that do. So these have a virus, that's why they're kind of yellow and small, and these have this resistance gene. Um, so one gene can really save an industry sometimes or really make a huge difference if it's put into a crop plant that really needs that trait. Um, also with fish, you can see some very dramatic differences here. These are the same age salmon grown in captivity, not in nature, um, and they have a growth hormone. So they're transgenic, meaning they have a new gene. This growth hormone that's turned on causes them to grow a whole lot faster if they have that gene. Another example, the one that I mentioned here is, that is in Ohio, is the Roundup Ready soybean. So if you spray these soybean plants, they can be planted right on top of last year's corn and they will not die um, and you get very clean fields compared to ones where there's a lot more weeds and there's a lot more challenges with managing those weeds. So in terms of the genetically engineered crops that are now in wide cul cultivation, there really aren't that many different kinds. Um, they are mainly have resistance to herbicides or insects or a few diseases. And it's just a few crops, starting with those ones I showed you initially, corn, cotton, and uh, soybean, and now a few others like canola, alfalfa, sugar beet, a few others. 
Um, but there is a potential for many more to be developed. Um, and these first few were kind of like the low-hanging fruit that companies could make a lot of money on because it was very easy to just take the same gene and put it into different crops. Um, fast forward to 2015, this is from a report from the National Academies of Science and it shows where ge genetically engineered crops have been approved. And it's pretty strange, I think, how, how limited their approvals are in some ways. Um, you see a lot in North America and South America um, and Australia and China, but New Zealand, Japan, Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia, and all these areas don't have approval of genetically engineered crops. Um, and then down here at the bottom are some of the new types that are being um, approved. Potato and apple are the most recent, and they're just in the United States. They're not very widely grown yet, but those are for a, no a non-browning trait. So you could cut the potato or cut the apple and it wouldn't brown. Um, so those are some of the newer applications. So in my research, I am, as you heard in the introduction, I'm interested in sort of domesticated crops that hybridize with wild relatives. And typically, to domesticate a crop in the past, you would, you would look to a wild relative, like a wild sunflower, and find the best individuals and select them and, and create a sunflower crop and maybe look to their wild relatives for other traits, and they could be added just by cross-pollination, just normal cross-pollination and breeding. But now we have all these transgenic traits to think about, um, which are, are really um, broadening the types of traits that can be put into crop plants. So the BT gene is, is very different from anything you would find in a wild, wild relative. And some of these genes, they overlap. They could be in a wild relative, but it could be faster to use genetic engineering to get them into your crop. And then there's also the potential for pharmaceutical and industrial traits. Um, so basically anything that you could get a plant to make, a chemical that is controlled by one or two genes could be um, a target for genetic engineering. So my research has focused on what happens when these genes move, um, either in the pollen or the seeds, they could move into the weedy relatives that are similar to the original wild relatives or other crops that are compatible with that one. And organic farmers have a lot to say about that because organic does not include genetic engineering. Um, so we're looking at can the gene flow go in that direction and then what difference does it make? And within the United States, these are some examples of crops that have wild relatives that are compatible with them things like sunflower and rice and all these ones you can see here, trees like poplar, um, many types of grasses, other trees, and even biofuel grasses like miscanthus and switchgrass that are, they're not very domesticated, but they're being used and they're, be, they're in the pipeline to be genetically engineered. So over the years, I've worked in a lot of different countries with really great collaborators. This is just some examples of the crops that have wild relatives in different countries that I've collaborated with people on. And um, it's, there's a community of people like me who, who try to answer these questions that people have of when you genetically engineered a crop, where are the genes going to go and does it make any difference? Um, some people just think of the genes themselves as a sort of genetic pollution, but I don't think of it that way. So I'll just tell you a couple highlights from our work. We did work on sunflowers and we had access to a BT transgene that made them resistant to insects that bore inside the plant and that eat the seeds inside the plant. So when we did experiments on this, um, we found that the BT gene helps the weedy sunflower just like it helps the crop. And we found that up to 55% more seeds were produced if the weedy wild sunflower got that gene. And we had to do this, it was outdoors, but we had to be very, very careful not to let these genes spread because everything that's biotech is regulated up till now and so we were following all sorts of protocols not to let them spread. Um, so then again in rice, we did a similar study in China with colleagues in China and we had a BT gene, put it into the hybrids between the crop rice and the weedy rice and then you back cross into the weeds to see if that BT gene would help the weedy rice, and it did. It reduced the herbivory, the damage by the insects, and also enhanced the fecundity, which means the number of seeds that they could produce. 
So, so any, and rice is an interesting example because the weedy rice grows right intermixed with the rice. Um, and so they can easily cross-pollinate and pick up any trait that you put into rice. Um, and when I did this work, I was working with a colleague, Bao Rong Lu, um, and some of his students and colleagues. And that, I'm just highlighting here, he was one of the best colleagues I have worked with in my entire career. And we published a lot of papers together, met up at lots of meetings all over the world. And so one of the benefits that I've enjoyed about the international aspect of these questions is meeting and working with colleagues like him. So now I'm going to um, sort of switch gears and talk about what happens when you start using a lot more Roundup in agriculture. And if you're not already, well, we sort of heard of herbicide resistant weeds or what happened, and I'm calling them Roundup resistant weeds, um, which is another topic that we worked on in my research group. So here you can see before we had these crops and then after, this is the amount of Roundup or glyphosate, it's the same thing used on each square mile. Here you can see the increase in glyphosate use, and this is when these Roundup Ready soybeans and other crops were introduced. So there's so much more of this herbicide being used that there's very strong um, selection for herbicide resistant weeds. And we worked on this one here. Here's a timeline of the big increase in herbicide resistant weeds. We worked on this one down here, the second one to evolve that resistance. It's, it's mare's tail, um, it's in here in Ohio, and when a field is sprayed, it just stays green. Um, it's a very, very healthy, vigorous weed that does well when Roundup is applied. So the question is, could you call this a super weed? And, and ones, other weeds like it. You spray them with Roundup, it used to kill them, it doesn't kill them anymore. Um, and here's just a graph from one of our papers. We worked with colleagues in Iowa, and we worked here in Ohio, and we, we collected seeds from different plants and grew them up in the greenhouse, sprayed them with different doses of Roundup, and found that a lot of them were red, which means high, highly resistant to Roundup. Um, very, very, very resistant. 40 times the original dose of Roundup did not kill those collections that are from the red circles and triangles. So originally, they could have been killed by 1x Roundup, and now they're not dying even if you use 40x. Um, and then the black arrows are showing ones that we tested the genetics of with people here in horticulture and crop science, Dave Mackey's lab. And we found a single point mutation right here. These are the susceptible ones. These are resistant. These are the amino acids. This is just a simple little mu mutation that could happen at any time in any population, just spontaneously it could be there. And as soon as you start spraying a lot of Roundup, you're going to select for those Roundup resistant weeds. Um, so all of this has been very exciting to me throughout my career to work on gene flow and the selection for things like herbicide tolerance. Um, sort of the intersection, I like to think of it as agriculture, ecology, evolution, and molecular biology. And another side uh, line that I've been a bit involved in is how polarized this debate is. Um, and so here's a few just illustrations of how um, Monsanto would be, like to be seen as food, health, and hope, and other people think of them as, you know, Monsanto land, very dangerous. Um, and so I, I don't really get involved in those discussions, except I try to add information so that people realize, oh yeah, these genes aren't going to harm you. We eat DNA all the time, but there are consequences. You know, so there, it's not a black and white situation, even though the debate is very polarized. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about CRISPR. Um, and so this is just to remind you that this type of genetic engineering really sort of took off in, after 2010. And um, so what is different about that? Um, Nature had an article that came out in 2015, CRISPR the disruptor. So that was about when it was really becoming widely known that there's this new method out there. What is it going to be used for? And I don't nearly have time to talk about that, all the uses, but basically biomedical research, it's going to be much easier and cheaper to edit genomes and learn a lot more about the function of genes and, and, and how to make use of that to cure diseases. 
Also in agriculture, just like the earlier transgenes, these methods can be used to improve crop plants. Um, but what has really caught my attention just in the past, say, three years, is gene drives. So CRISPR is needed to make a gene drive. And a gene drive is a type of genetic engineering that pushes, it drives a trait into a population. So here you can see um, the little schematic from this paper by Kevin S. Felt and, and George Church and co colleagues. They wrote a paper in the journal eLife that kind of started this. Um, and they showed that you can have two mosquitoes. One of them has a gene drive, which is all of this down here. And everything that it mates with gets that gene drive. And pretty soon, all of the mosquitoes have that trait. They have two copies of that gene instead of normal Mendelian inheritance. So it's like super Mendelian inheritance. So you can drive a trait into a population, even if it's bad for that population. So that mosquitoes could end up being like all male and not have any females to mate with. Or a trait that was good, like maybe they could all be not carrying malaria anymore, and so they're resistant to that, and, and a good trait could be driven through. But there's two things about this that shocked me, is one is that it's a gene drive, and the other that we're talking about wild populations now. We're not just talking about crop plants and agriculture, agriculture, aquaculture. We're talking about wild populations. So in this eLife paper, um, there was a lot of uh, creative thinking going on that they, they talked about, uh, as felt and Church and others, all, they came up with this schematic of all the ways you might use a gene drive. Um, and they called it new tools for ecology, which kind of rubbed me the wrong way because these are molecular biologists you know, at Harvard and MIT. They're not ecologists, but they know a lot. And so they thought maybe for the environment, we could use this to control invasive species or help threatened species. Um, human health, maybe controlling vector-borne diseases. And agriculture, some possibilities there. Um, maybe making new types of um, pesticides. And you have the gene drive that goes into what, you know, to protect um, a crop, say, from a new type of chemical. So all these different types of applications um, potentially are possible. And the one that is moving the fastest is with mosquitoes and malaria. Um, so there are a lot of people working around the world on trying to genetically engineer mosquitoes with gene drives so that either they won't carry malaria and other mos mosquito-borne diseases um, like Zika and things like that, or just wipe out that species of mosquito. Um, and so there's a lot of debate and a lot of research going on about that. Um, but to their credit, these in this same paper, this is kind of low, I'll just read it out for you. Um, as felt at all, they said, at the same time there are valid concerns about our ability to accurately predict ecological and human consequences of these interventions. So while they were proposing all these great uses, they were also starting to warn people that we don't really know how this is going to turn out, which countries are going to use this technology for what purposes, um, things like that. And, and so right after their paper came out, um, people started to react to it in some ways. So a group from Australia wrote a, pa a paper t titled, um, Is CRISPR-based gene drive a biocontrol silver bullet that you could use for like managing these invasive species? or a global conservation threat. Because potentially, if you want to get rid of a population by making all the individuals male or whatever method you might use, sterile, um, you could potentially eliminate that target species, maybe even from the whole planet. It just depends on how connected all these populations are and how widely you release the individuals that are genetically engineered. But wh whatever they interbreed with is going to get that trait. Um, and so I thought it was really good that the National Academies came out with a report as fast as they could. Um, this came out in 2016, Gene Drives on the Horizon, sort of outlining what is known, what is not known, um, how, how inadequate our regulations are now for, for dealing with these kinds of things. So the science has been moving a lot more quickly than, um, than the regulations have and, and the policy. And there's a lot of ethical questions, too. So um, that is really well described 
in, in that paper. I'm going backwards. Okay. Um, and then this slide is just to remind you how interconnected we are around the world and how organisms can hitchhike on boats and on planes and with people and with shipments of cargo, food and things like that. So that uh, we really need to consider this whenever a gene drive is introduced that you might think it's going to stay on Australia um, and get rid of the cane toads in Australia or other species that they really don't want there. Um, <laughs> actually, they're talking about using them for feral cats in Australia, which I think is an interesting one because that's not a wild species. But um, there could, these genes could move to other continent, continents and other populations. And every, every invasive species is usually a native species somewhere else. Um, so, do you really want the rabbits in Australia to carry this back to the rabbits somewhere where they might be wanted? Or are there certain species like mosquitoes and ticks and things like that that we just, we don't care if they go extinct? I mean, this is, this is the kind of thinking people are doing. It's sort of very long term, not immediate, but it's, it's becoming more possible. So I started, I put together this slide just the way I like to think of it is, is when you're going to evaluate a gene drive, what are some considerations? Like how much do you even need it? If people just want to make money on some application of a gene drive, that's not going to be as important as humanitarian aid, like, like trying to deal with malaria and things like that. Or some, some gene drives would, not, would suppress populations, others would just alter them. Suppression could be just local or it could mean extinction. And maybe the goal is extinction. That's an interesting case in Africa with the mosquitoes. They really want multiple countries to get these gene drive mosquitoes and have the mosquitoes go extinct in those countries. That's one of the goals. Um, and then persistence, um, will it just be a few months? There, there are new types of gene drives that might be more temporary and hopefully these will become developed quickly enough so that we don't use the original primitive kind of gene drive that is not temporary because some of them could last a very long time and how widely will they be spreading small and isolated versus global. Um, so it would be good if there could be some kind of moratorium on these applications that we're not so sure about. Um, there's a lot of ethical questions as I alluded to. It's a very very active area of debate right now is how and where gene drives should be used. Luckily, some of the predictions are, are not coming true. Like what I mean luckily is it's taking longer to even get a genetically engineered wild mouse, even though you can make them in the lab with house mouse, the wild mouse, it's not that easy. So a lot of these applications aren't gonna be quite as easy as people thought, um, which gives us a little more time to figure all of this out. Okay, so the very last little thing I want to tell you about before I wind up is Kevin Esvelt, um, who, do, who published that paper that I was talking about, told the world all the things that gene drives could do. He was looking for an application and he didn't want to freak people out by using a gene drive. So he identified this case in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard where Lyme disease is a big problem and people get it from ticks and ticks get the disease from mice. Um, so what if you could engineer wild mice and not even use a gene drive at first just to see if this would work? That's what he's working on right now. So here you can see where Lyme disease is in the US. Not so much in Ohio, it's really interesting. But this is where the ticks and the deer are transmitting <coughs> Lyme disease. And so he's focusing on Nantucket and a little bit on Martha's Vineyard and these nearby islands. So I got very interested in this because I'm an ecologist and I used to work in those areas and I approached them and said, I'd like to know as much as possible about your project so I can write an article about it. And they were, they were very forthcoming and they, I've talked to them a bunch of times about their project. Um, uh, here's a, a diagram showing how it would work if the mice with the arrows don't carry the bacterium, it's less likely to get into the ticks and get over to people. Um, so that's the whole cycle of Lyme disease. So I wrote a paper, I started giving talks on this, and I wrote a paper about what are the ecological questions that we would have if you started just gene editing these mice, not even a gene drive, but just making them resistant to Lyme disease. And um, these are some figures from the paper showing how complicated these 
communities are. Here's the cute little white-footed mouse. Um, some people see white-footed mice as a pest because they can get into your house um, or they can eat you know, stuff in your garage. They can chew on it. But um, they're also a really big part of the food chain shown down here. So they're like a hub species in a lot of forest ecosystems because they're very common and they're the prey of a lot of species. Um, so I wrote a couple of things about this. I wrote a paper in bioscience on my perspective and got a lot of input from other people because this was a big switch for me. I mean, I'm a plant ecologist. What, what right do I have to talk about mice? But I do know about genetic engineering and how people view it and what the general issues are for any kind of genetically engineered organism. So that's what I wrote about in this paper. And then um, this is kind of interesting. I was invited to write um, an op-ed piece for the Boston Globe because they wanted a pro and con. So Kevin Esfelt wrote this pro piece about all the potential of stopping Lyme disease with gene-edited mice. And I was supposed to write the con piece. And basically, if you ever want to see it, it's like all I did was say, I have a lot of questions. I don't know if this is good or bad, but it's too early to say. But there's a lot of questions that need to be addressed if you're going to release a mouse that's genetically engineered and all of its progeny, well, half of its progeny would get this trait. If you add a gene drive, all of them would. So there's a lot of questions, uh, even with just gene editing and wild species. So that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop here. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview of how my thinking has evolved and how the field of genetic engineering has moved. There's a lot more, of the course, that I didn't cover, but I think this issue now of gene drives and gene editing and lack of regulation and lack of coordination ac across governments and countries is going to be with us for some time. It'll be really interesting to see what happens. Hopefully, new generations of scientists will pick this up and, um, and we can avoid the worst case scenarios and take advantage of technology. Any technology has risks and benefits. This is an especially tr challenging one, I think. Thank you very much. I think we have time for about uh, 15 minutes of questions. So I hope you have many questions. Or you give very long answers. One of the two. Or, so or we don't have to do that. <laughs> we don't have to do that at all. But who has a question? I'll pass the mic so that everyone can hear. Why have the Europeans been so resistant to genetic engineering crops and mice? Yeah, that's a really good question. Can people hear me okay? Um, yeah, so um, I think, I think there's a, it's complicated, but uh, it had to do a lot with the environmental movement being much stronger there and people trusting the environmental groups more than their own governments. Meanwhile, some of the seed companies there did not want to have to compete with the American companies. So they weren't really going to fight when the environmentalists were picking up steam. Um, and so there's just, it's a mixture of, you know, sort of trade and environmental concerns, I think, that contribute to that, in, just in a nutshell. But it's, it's been really interesting. And, and surprisingly, I'll give one of my long answers, uh, people in Europe have done a ton of research on risk assessment, even more than in the United States. So I would get invited to these meetings in Europe there'd be lots of people very, very concerned about what are the risks of doing this. Um, and yet, you know, now that we know, I think we know that the first crops don't pose any in risks other than normal agriculture itself, um, they're still against it. So, yeah. Other comments or questions? Over there, he was next, I believe. Okay, you did. Thank you very much, very interesting. Um, one of the features that you mentioned, or, or dimensions that you would be able to move this on, was uh, either shorter or longer de de uh, gene drives, and you, you had like a month or something. Can you explain for somebody who's not a biologist how you could have something that could last just a month or so? Sure. Um, Okay, this is getting a little outside my area, but they're talking about self-limiting gene drives, different techniques for it. And there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, but one would be that if it had to stay in a certain area, like they could only mate with their same kind of 
subpopulation so that there would be like a barrier. That's more of a spatial limitation. I don't think a month is really practical. I should probably change that slide. But it, you could stop it within a few generations if you, you release different um, groups of individuals, let's say mice, uh, and it's only when they interbreed and you have three elements, each one has a different element, you have to get all three together that it would work for a while and then when they interbreed it would stop working. So it's, a, it's called a daisy chain model. Um, and it's, it's a theoretical model. Um, so it hasn't been accomplished yet. But if it could, or here's another thing. People have written articles that these are gonna break down anyway because, because that's what happens with selection, natural selection. You get a mutation and suddenly you thought you had all males. Just think of Jurassic Park or something like that. You know, then you get a female. And so that's not intentional breakdown, but people have written that a silver lining might be that they wouldn't last that long because you'd get mutations in the gene drive itself. Yeah. Pat. Well, thanks. I think my question is more varying or even extension of that. I was going to ask, uh, in analogy with uh, Roundup, you know, what are the chances of, in this case, organisms just not uh, developing a so-called resistance to the gene drives? I think you've started that, but that's a crucial question, I would think, because it, can't, it's hard to live with the absolute, you know, it's just going to go all the way through to the end. Right. Because of maybe other factors I don't know about. But it, I think it really matters in deciding how the policies and risks and all this kind of stuff is. Exactly. It does matter a lot. So it's not, um, it's not, the molecular biologists understand that and they want to put these genes in, in, in around um, traits that are essential for survival. So, so that basically there's going to be less chance of a mutation knocking them out because if they're just in this area of the genome that is not as likely to have mutations, if I understand it correctly. But it is something that really needs to be worked out and it's hard because you can't really do these experiments in a lab. You know, you can do them with fruit flies um, and mosquitoes and maybe with mice, but it's just really challenging, really, really challenging. Uh, okay, we'll do you and then you. Okay. So, Alice, we've had genetically modified organisms ever since we started selecting breeding. How does that long established uh, practice contrast with what's going on today? Okay, um, what, what you're saying is that selective breeding equals genetic modification, which is okay to say, but I think engineering is the difference. Engineering means you take a trait from anywhere, even a synthetic gene that never could occur in nature, and you put it in that organism, and you turn it on so it's a trait that you could never get from normal genetic, you know, old-fashioned selective breeding. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, then there's all these other interesting differences about patents and regulations and stuff like that, but as far as the phenotype, it can be a different phenotype that you could never get, meaning a different trait that you could never get through regular breeding. I think that's the biggest difference. Although now, so like those Roundup Ready um, soybeans, you know, there's, they had to take a gene from a bacterium to do that. But all those weeds that are getting resistant with the little point mutation that I showed you, you could just take the wild relative of a sunflower that's resistant and cross it into um, a cultivated sunflower and put that glyphosate resistance into the cultivated sunflower and it wouldn't be considered a ge genetically engineered organism because it was natural pollination. Isn't that weird? So it doesn't all make sense at all. Yeah. <laughs> My question is an extension of his. Uh, so we've had selective breeding for a long time. Yeah. How long have we had GEOs? When did they really start developing and proliferating? Well, yeah, GEOs, so in the lab, it was much earlier, like the 1970s and 80s, um, but the very first crops, my very, one of my very first slides, they were suddenly released. So if, if that's what you think of as a GEO proliferating, um, the soybean, the corn, the cotton was 1996. Um, so 25, 30 years of experience, they're always changing. Um, they're being stacked together and more and more different types of crops. 
But you know, I don't really see any disasters that have happened, even from a human health or environmental standpoint. It's more the practice of how we do agriculture, you know, because people are worried about, you know, there's a lot of lawsuits out there right now about glyphosate should be banned um, and things like that. Does that address? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm curious about what well, was almost a throwaway line about the eradication of species, and you mentioned uh, that uh, perhaps it, it would be all right if. There were no more mosquitoes in the world. Is people worried about? I mean, is there some group that says, no, we need mosquitoes for X or Y or Z or something? Yeah. There's, that's a really good question. I think it's a cultural and, you know, question that ethicists have to help work out because there's so many different opinions out there. Sure, there's some that are more popular, some that are less. I mean, I don't particularly like the squirrels in my backyard, but when I had a grad student from Mexico come, he said, oh, you have squirrels, you know, and he was like, he loved them. And, <laughs> and I think there are, I'm, now that I'm studying ticks, I have respect for ticks. Um, <laughs> they are amazing how they've evolved. And you might have an attitude that we shouldn't tinker with nature, or you might have an attitude that, well, it's there for us to work with, you know? So there's so many points of view on that. Um, so that's a really, and that's what concerns me is that, you know, some country is going to decide to get rid of some species that other people really value or really need or want and, you know, what's going to happen. Species. Yeah, or all kinds of consequences. Um, sorry. I'd be just curious to know uh, some, what you cited in that, in your article where you were doing the con side on the pro-con. It's, it's clear that we, that we would love to get rid of Lyme disease. We, you had some concerns, and I'd be interested to hear one or two of you. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I guess my concerns are that we need to understand how the engineering is going to affect these mice. Is it going to have any side effects that we don't understand? Like, could they be more aggressive or more prolific when they don't get the Lyme disease? You know, these are just sort of worst case scenarios that need to be worked out. Um, and, or is there something about the interaction with Lyme with other diseases that we don't really understand? So you take out the Lyme and then what happens? Um, so I had to introduce just a bunch of hypotheticals, but the goal is to basically create mice that are only different in that one trait and you know what that is and there's no side effects and there's no downside to it. So they're just, they're just like the mice that came before and their genetic variation is the same, all these things. So I just kind of listed all the, all the criteria that it, it would take for me as an ecologist to feel totally comfortable with that. And I didn't say it was impossible. I just said I had a lot of questions. Yeah. I think we have time for two more questions. Um, I don't know. Sure. A number of times you mentioned there are some worst case scenarios that are out there. Uh, could you identify some of the worst case scenarios that are out there that Tell us whether or not you think they're believable or not. Are you talking about gene drives uh, or anything? In any, in any of uh, let's see. I mean, a worst case scenario might be you put a pesticide into a lot of crop plants and it ends up killing the pollinators. I mean, the pesticide is being made inside the plant, so other insects won't eat it. But when the pollinators come, this is very hypothetical, but we know pollinators are a kind of insect that we want. Um, so if you try to get rid of one kind of insect, are you going to get rid of all of them? Uh, you know, is there some indirect effect? That, that's like one hypothetical. But I really, I don't have any worst case scenarios right now. Um, I guess if you started using gene drives, I could think of some, you know, where I, I don't want to see these species. Like even that mouse, if, if people decided they didn't want that mouse in the ecosystem, I think that would be a negative from an ecological point of view of maintaining, you know, all the organisms that depend on that species, that kind of thing. Final question. Well, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> you decide. I can't decide. No, I saw a very <laughs> bold hand go up, so we're going to go back. Okay, well, um, I was thinking of what seems to be a worst case scenario, which is uh, you produce corn that is resistant to Roundup. 
so that you can use the Roundup more efficiently to kill weeds. Uh, what then happens to the bee population, which has been pretty much uh, threatened by Roundup specifically, such that in some areas of the world it's 50% of what it was uh, 10 or so years ago. Yeah. So that seems to me to be a close to a worst case scenario. You said the bee population, right? Yeah. I know bees are declining. I'm not sure of the role of Roundup, but it could be contributing. Um, but also butterflies are a good one. Monarch butterflies that depend on milkweed, which when you have Roundup ready crops, there's a lot less milkweed around. So if indeed those bees are, if the Roundup is one of the pesticides that they're suffering from, that would be a worst case. I know there's a lot of other worse ones out there. <laughs> so some of this is just normal agriculture. It's not good for the insect diversity and some of the species that we want to preserve. But th thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah. It, it takes a lot of people to think of these things. Thank you. Let's give her a big round of applause, please.